Hi, hello, Vita, and welcome. Welcome to Milondin. I'm Jola Piesakowska, and this is the place where we explore Polish arts and culture here in London. Today, my guest is Roger Morehouse. We're meeting up online ahead of his book talk at Ognisko Polskie. And the book that, uh, that he's going to talk about is The Devil's Alliance, Hitler's Pact with Stalin, 1939 to 1940. I'm just going to introduce you to Roger, and that's that's the book there. Um, meticulous, vividly readable, grim and compelling book. Could not be more topical. Um, that's one of the things we're going to explore today. Um, I I mean, I'm, I was absolutely thrilled um, when when Roger said that uh, he could meet me today here online. Um, he studied history and politics at the School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies at the University of London. Um, early 1990s, and then he studied at Dusseldorf and Strathclyde, and beca- he also became he began his writing career working for Professor Norman Davis, and he collaborated with him on many of the recent publications, including Europe: A History, The Hours of History, and Rising 44, and co-authored Microcosm. Now, this was the book that uh, Shvinti Mukoi, Father Christmas, was very kind in giving to me. And it's the first time I thought, oh, who's that, Roger? Roger Morehouse, who is that? Because at the time, Norman Davis, you know, absolutely in awe of the, the work that he's doing in uh, explaining Polish history and bringing that to an English audience. Um, and this book absolutely gripped me because the writing is just not like a history book. It's vibrant, um, it's relatable, and what's really clever about this is it's following one city, Breslau, which is modern Wrocław, from AD 1000 all through its history, um, and it really is the history of Europe in this one city. Really, really fantastic book. In 2020, Roger's work um, was applauded, thanked, when he was awarded um, the Knight's Cross of the Order of Merit to the Republic of Poland for promoting this great understanding of Polish history abroad. And the book that um, every day on Twitter, I have to say, somebody, somebody comments about this book or tweets about it, first to fight. And this is the forgotten story of the Second World War. Um, something very, very close to Poles living in London, uh, Poles in Poland, um, but Poles living in London who kind of just really felt forgotten about, not understood. And this book really just explained this German-Soviet invasion of Poland and really detailed the brutality of the opening campaign of the Second World War, um, tackling the mythology and also assessing, assessing the role of Britain and France in the conflict. Other books by Roger, Berlin at War, Third Reich, really fascinating way of approaching history. I mean, this this is what really excites me about reading uh, one of Roger's books, is he'll take a subject and then present it in a a really clever, clever way. And I think the Third Reich in 100 Objects was just fascinating. It really brought it to life. um, And it was something that I was very, very uncomfortable reading about. And through the objects, I found that I was able to be much more objective in my reaction to what he was talking about. And here we have Devil's Alliance. So let me introduce my guest. I have introduced my guest. Welcome, my guest, Roger. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for coming today online. That was a wonderful introduction. I must get you to do all of my introductions from now on. Oh, you're very kind, Roger. Um, you know, it's 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 very easy when somebody has done so much amazing work like you've done, um, you. and and promoted the Polish history in England. Well, yeah. it's something I, I'm you know quite have been quite passionate about. It was it was the the, the it was Poland that effectively you know um, persuaded me emotionally to go to university when I did, and to go to the university that I went to. Um, it was the experience of, you know, sitting on my sofa watching 1989 unfold 
uh, and that whole sort of narrative primarily in my mind it was still you know synonymous with with Le Forenza and solidarity um and it's that 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 uh, motivated me to want to go and find out more about Poland and I still have the same fascination now as I did 30 years ago so um you know it's oh, a, that's it's a, it's a, it's a it's a love affair that doesn't let me go, unfortunately. Good, good, good. <laughs> uh, we've actually got a comment here from James McNeil. First to fight is first class. Wonderful. Thank you, James. Thank you. And that that is the kind of comments you hear nearly every day on Twitter. I know it's very. People are very kind about, them, and particularly that book. It's it's a it's a funny situation when you write um, for a living, and I have now I think seven books written. I think that the seventh being my, my book on the Wadosh group, which isn't out yet. Um, but you do, to some extent, you don't know which, you know, which, how they're going to be received. And to some extent, it's a little bit over, over dramatizing it to say, you know, you don't know if it's going to be any good, because I think you do kind of know that it's pretty good, but you don't know how it's going to be received. Um, and to, to, you know, to, to, to be well received and to have people saying, oh, you know, I love that book. And, you know, it taught me so much and so on. It's it's such a it's such a lovely thing to hear. Genuinely, it really is. It's, you know, we we don't just sort of sit there and take that in our stride as authors and historians. It really does mean a lot. Oh, wonderful! And of course, you know, this we're meeting today, but on Wednesday you'll be at Ognisko Polskie. Indeed. Talking. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, which is somewhere I I don't think I was racking my brain. I don't think I've ever actually spoken there. I've been I've been to presentations there before. I've been to lectures there, and I've been been there for for dinner many times, of course, um, as everybody should. Um, but I don't think I've ever actually given a talk there, so I think this is a first, and I'm looking forward to it a lot. Oh well, we're we're honoured, and um, you know anyone who can make it, tickets are still available. Just go to the Ognisko Polskie website forward slash events. <laughs> we'll find you there. Um, so just coming on to onto this book um, that we're talking about, which is Devil's Alliance. Uh, what is the Devil's Alliance? And, you know, what, what was actually your motivation for exploring the Nazi Soviet pact? Well, the Devil's Alliance itself is, is shorthand for this um, strategic alignment, we can call it, between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in this period between 1939 and 41. Um, I should stress in advance before you get lots of sort of green ink uh, messages at the bottom of the screen that it wasn't a formal alliance. It never was. Um, the, the Nazi Soviet pact, which is essentially the kickoff for this relationship, shall we say, between Moscow and Berlin, um, is not a treaty of, an al of alliance. It's a treaty of non-aggression, essentially. But it has within it um, uh, this famous secret protocol, which essentially means... It, delineates the line upon which you know uh, Moscow and Berlin will divide Central Europe between them as they put it at the time in the event of a territorial reorganization and that territorial re reorganization is the war that breaks out on the 1st of September with the German invasion so they are sort of it, it's an essential sort of uh, precondition effectively for, for World War II happening in the way that it did which we'll come on to in a minute mm -hmm. so I, the Devil's Alliance crucially for those um, who are and I point this as much as much towards uh, native Brits as Poles. But if you look at the title, it's devils, plural, it's devils, S apostrophe, two devils, not just one devil. And I think this is a crucial point that I often sort of bang on about, um, particularly at the moment. But when we're talking about this early period of the war, we have to acknowledge, and this is pointing the finger mainly at, at the Western narrative, we have to acknowledge that there are two villains, there are two devils uh, in uh, European history at this point, Hitler and Stalin. Um, the Western narrative has a very sort of peculiar, myopic um, viewpoint towards Stalin. It sort of sees Stalin at this point as essentially as an ally in waiting. You know, they're waiting for Barbarossa in the summer of 1941, the German invasion, and then Stalin will fall into the camp of the, of the Grand Alliance, which he does. But viewing him in that way and accepting the fiction that he's a neutral in 1939-40, because that's what he proclaimed the Soviet Union to be. Um, accepting that fiction completely me means that we, the Western narrative, narrative completely misunderstands the first two years of the war, um, which is a period in which, you know, which is dominated by that very uh, strategic uh, and economic alliance and, or, or, or alignment between Germany and, and the Soviet Union. And if we can't see that, we have to, 
you know, change our perspective to see those two villains, those two devils acting side by side. So hence the title, The Devil's Alliance, Two Devils in Alliance. Um, why did I write it? Well, um, the first thing to say on that is that I have, uh, as a historian, I have a sort of a horror of writing things about subjects that everyone already knows about. Um, that, you know, writing, for example, I always, I always use the example of the Dam Busters raid, which, as I'm sure you know, you're like, you know, kind of looms large in the British historiography of the war, you know, a great example of British pluck and ingenuity and bravery, of course, of all the pilots and all of that. But the end result of the Dam Busters raid, apart from a few thousand deaths of forced laborers, many of whom are probably Polish, tragic in itself, but the end result is actually not very much. It doesn't achieve much. So it's a fascinating story. Yes, okay. It doesn't achieve much in the grand scheme of things. And yes, you know, if you if you go down to your nearest bookshop and you look at the history section, you're bound to find a book about the Dan Busters Road because it's such a big thing for British historiography, right? And this is one of those sort of things that I can't really abide. I mean, I, fair enough, it's an interesting story, but it doesn't help us understand what's going on in the war in the wider story. It doesn't help us understand, you know, as I, as I said, you know, a period of two years of strategic alliance between Nazi Germany and Soviet Union, for example. So what I want to do in my books is always to either take a familiar story and kind of turn it on its head and analyze it from a different perspective, which is what I did with, with Berlin at war, for example, um, or look for subjects that are, that are, very significant but have been ignored traditionally for various reasons and that's why you know polish history is for me is such a rich sort of hunting ground because there's so much there that is massively significant um and is barely present in the western narrative so my last or more or less my last two books so devil's alliance was in 2014 on the nazi soviet pact um and then first to fight which you, you very kindly mentioned on the uh, september campaign of 1939 is another one so those two subjects i think are, are, are you know high well overdue that they be properly understood uh, and proper properly integrated into that sort of western narrative of the war and i'm i'm doing my best to to achieve that it's a slow process but i'm doing my best well it's it's really appreciated and um i think what, what the effect it has on my generation who were born here, um, whose parents experienced what what actually really happened um, during the during the Second World War for for Poles, is a terrific sadness and feeling of injustice. Mm. And I feel that by somebody like you taking it, um, bringing it to an English speaking audience, you're actually helping me understand the the kind of the atmosphere that I was brought up in, which was a yeah. feeling of injustice, a feeling of sadness and loss, yeah. um, not being understood, um, almost feeling that what we went through as a as a nation was in vain. Yes. And I, I think for certainly for, for my generation speaking to people like me born here, um, that's the feeling that we had and we feel that these books and, and really, you know, your work on these books is is a tremendous kind of liberation. And we can understand it better as well because it's given a context so we can understand yeah. what it was our parents felt so sad about. Yeah, no, I, I can I can see that. Um, and it's it is uh, for me, it's very important, I think, because, you know, Poland, Poland itself, if you like, has been very kind to me. All of my books have been published in Polish. I've, I've always been very well made welcome in Poland. And as, as you saw, you know, they were kind enough to give me a medal a couple of years ago, which is, you know, one of my rather pathetic, but nonetheless, one of my little life ambitions, um, you know, met. So that was that was a wonderful thing. Beyond that, you know, there's there's Polonia, there's the Polish diaspora, um, much of which, incidentally, is, you know, directly related to the Nazi Soviet pact and the deportations, you know, to the Soviet interior and all of that, as you well know from your from your family story, right? Um, and that has also been a, um, a very sort of um, um, favorable sort of atmosphere to work in. And, and you know, as we're, we're talking now and through Ogniska and, you know, the Polish diaspora in London, also very enthusiastic, very supportive, absolutely. And I, I treasure that. Um, I always think I'd, uh, my sort of 
bottom line is actually trying in a strange way, and is this like kind of contradict you a little bit with that? But for me, my bottom line is almost to try and bring Polish history to a non-Polish audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I think, to a large extent, you know, with with Polish audiences and with Polonia audiences, Polish diaspora, you are sort of preaching to the choir to some extent because they do understand it. They do know what you're talking about. They have personal experience or familial experience of what you're writing about. But for me. And I understand why, you know, from what you said, why that's significant, that, that, that it should have a resonance. But for the non-Polish audience beyond that, um, there you, see, you you have people who've never even really considered Poland and Polish history, never even given mm -hmm. it a second thought. And to try and bring them into the fold and show yeah. them that this is important and this is significant to the wider story and, and they really should be interested in it. You know, I, I think that is, I think that's... I find, you know, a really significant um, sort of part of what I'm what I'm doing. Um, I had a lovely email, actually. I've just mentioned uh, a chap from America. The, the first to fight came out in America as Poland 1939, different title, but the same book. And I had a lovely email out of the blue from a chap over there who said, um, um, you know, he was of Polish extraction, um, but he, he didn't speak Polish. He didn't feel Polish, he said. Uh, and he'd never even given his Polishness a second thought. It was just a sort of a family thing. And then he picked up my book and he read it. And he said at the end, and I actually get a little bit emotional, but he said at the end, um, I've never felt prouder to be Polish. Like Aww. it's almost like it converted him to bit to suddenly being a Pole, which I thought was wonderful. That is um, wonderful. In yeah. a sense, it, it's sort of those people. You want to bring those people in and say, look, this is really fascinating. This is really significant history. You know, you really need to know about it, not because you're Polish, but because you're a human being. You know, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And you know, that's that was the, you know the whole driver with doing Milondin, is yeah. this is my way of saying to Londoners, you know, we're part of London. We're invisible in many ways. Um, mm. You know, I've actually had people say to me, "Oh, we know. How, how do we know that you're any different from us?" And this is how we're different. Um, you know, we have a different history. We have a fantastic arts world and we want to share that with you you know we want you to see it's important to share these things and yeah, to absolutely. and and to hear about this stuff absolutely um, yeah crucially so mm, and i've actually got another comment from james full disclosure <laughs> i'm a damn busters fanboy but you're absolutely right about the bewildering number of books i mean it is a great yeah. story. it is a great story but i'm just you know just wider significance I would argue not very much. And it's a kind of a, a if I'm honest, talking to James really here, but I'm, if I'm honest, I see the Dan Busters as, as a bit of a bit of British navel gazing, I'm afraid. But there we are. Maybe that's me. <laughs> but it's, you know, on a Sunday afternoon, it's, it's quite a Fair good enough. film to watch, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, so I've got another question for you, which is my question. What's the importance of the hitler Stalin Pact on the events leading up to September 1939, the invasion of Poland? This was something I learned from your book mm. about the Baltic states and the outbreak of war in Europe. This was yeah. something I really, really got from your book. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Nazi-Soviet Pact is absolutely crucial. You can't, and it, it, it signed, you know, a week before the outbreak of war, before the German invasion of Poland. That signed on the 28th of uh, sorry 23rd of August 1939, um, and as I said, it basically um, secures Hitler's how do we put this sort of forward front. It secures Stalin on side with with Hitler, so Hitler then knows that Stalin isn't going to intervene uh, in a negative manner and sort of you know um, frustrate his uh, invasion plans for Poland. So he invades in safe in the knowledge that Stalin isn't going to do anything about it, and of course the um, the realities of logistics mean that nobody else can do much about it either. Um, the British and the French, as we know, you know, declare war on the 3rd of September, but logistics dictate they can't project their power to the Eastern Baltic. Um, the only thing they can do is attack Germany in the West, which they spectacularly pretty much fail to do as well. Um, so Hitler's acting, he knows with his Nazi Soviet pact, he's acting with considerable impunity in attacking Poland. So it's hard to see World War II uh, breaking out in the way that it does in Europe um, without the Nazi-Soviet pact 
as the sort of essential precondition for that. Um, as I've said before, the secret protocol to the pact, which is the crucial bit, the actual text of the pact is rather anodyne, it's rather, rather bland. It's just a sort of standard non-aggression pact. And there were lots of non-aggression pacts that were signed in the 1930s. It was very much, you know, the sort of standard go-to uh, sort of treaty formula of various countries. So there was a German-Polish non-aggression pact, for example. Yeah. And there was also a Polish-Soviet non-aggression pact in this period. So the text of the pact is, is very sort of anodyne and standard. The, the crucial bit is in this secret protocol, which is the bit that the Soviets for a long time, you know, denied the existence of. Um, even Molotov went to his death. And Molotov being the, um, Vyacheslav Molotov was the Soviet foreign minister who actually signed the, uh, the Nazi-Soviet pact. It's sometimes known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop pact because of him and his count, uh, German counterpart, um, Joachim von Ribbentrop. Um, he went to his death. He lived to a remarkable old age. He died in 1986, believe it or not, Molotov. Oh, really? Uh, and he was interviewed in, in old age by a Soviet journalist. So this is kind of almost just presaging a little bit the, um, uh, you know, the period of Glasnost and Perestroika that, uh, that Gorbachev brought in. But he was interviewed by, by Soviet journalists, and I think about 1983, before, shortly before he died. And they said, you know, what about this story of the, um, of the secret protocol? You know, it's still officially denied by the Soviets at this point. He said, what about the secret protocol? Did, did that actually happen? Was that a real thing? And, and even then, Molotov said, no, no. He said, he said, I was very close to these events. Of course, he signed it. Uh, I was very close to these events, and I can confirm that this is a lie. Right? And even that late in life, he's still denying the truth of, of history. And Stalin, um, post-war, I think 48, Stalin penned this um, a pamphlet, which was called The Falsifiers of History, in which he accused the West of rewriting history because they they basically said, well, you know, we've got the text of the secret protocol. And it was published by the American State Department. And he writes this pamphlet accusing the West of falsifying history. So you can see you can see this kind of you can see these trends here of this sort of Soviet idea. And you can see it happening now as well with with Putin's Russia. You can see this um, idea of this very conscious manipulation of history. You know, saying that we're the only ones telling the truth. And oh, by the way, what we say today isn't the same as what we said yesterday because, you know, times change. Uh, the necessities of propaganda change. Um, everyone else is a liar. You know, it, it's it, it's a it, this really blatant manipulation of of uh, of news, of the facts, of, of the truth of history, and all of that um, is it, very much in evidence in this story as well. Um, so in terms of, sorry, I, that was a bit of a, um, a, a digression, but we go back to you know, the outbreak of war. It's, it's, you, can't, you can't imagine the war breaking out in the way that it does without the Nazi-Soviet pact. And crucially, the secret protocol is what divides up Central Europe between uh, Hitler and Stalin. So this consigns um, the Baltic states to Soviet control. So they're um, occupied and annexed by the Soviet Union in 1940, for example, become, become Soviet republics, much against their own will. Um, and, and of course, it, then also the, the, the Soviets invade Finland um, in 1940. It's another chapter of, the, of World War II that we in the West do not understand because it does not fit the standard narrative. Um, it's an amazing story, by the way. It's known, known colloquially as the Winter War. And it's an astonishing story. You, can see, you could see shades. Um, I thought this when, um, when we saw that traffic jam, that armored traffic jam that was bearing down on Kiev, remember, at yeah. the beginning of the war. We were told that there was this, um, back in February, March, there was this sort of 40 mile tailback of Russian armor that was queued up to get into Kiev. And I remember um, talking with, you know, family and friends and people who were saying, oh, God, that's that looks awful. That's that's doesn't look good for Kiev, you know, once they all get going. And I thought at the time, they're not going to get going. Because I thought this is this is exactly the same as the tactics used by the Finns in 1940. So they had this wonderful tactic of what they called the Moti, where they would um, you had the you know overwhelming you know in terms of manpower, firepower, armor, everything. The, the Soviets were were numerically superior in every single category against the Finns. The Finns basically had the weather because the the war started in November of 39. They had the weather and they had their own ingenuity. Uh, and what they used to do was sort of put an armored roadblock at the front of one of the, 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 you know, 
blocking one of these roads into Finland. Um, and basically you had to fight the first couple of, you know, tanks or armored vehicles, whatever it is that was in front of you. Everything else was just jammed up and they couldn't get around you because of the trees and the snow. So they're just in a traffic jam. Right. So this was this at a stroke, you know, nullified the Soviets numerical superiority. It was a brilliant piece of tactics. And then they would go through mainly at night and they would send ski troops through and they would just cut those armored columns into pieces. And it's wow. an amazing story. It's incredible. Um, as you will know, you'll love, because it's, uh, I do a short passage on it in, in uh, the Devil's Alliance, but it really, yeah. it really deserves wider readership because it's, it's an amazing story. Anyway, I'm digressing. Mm. Well, I, I many years ago I had a an au pair from Finland, and um, we actually we travelled over to to visit one summer, and I just realised I knew nothing about Finland, um, mm. and how it'd been occupied, mm. um, and it was a real eye opener. Um, again, a story that's not been told. Yeah, um, and I, I really enjoyed that in your book. I really enjoyed. It's like ah, right, okay, so this is what they were talking about. Um, I, I just felt that sort of pieces of a jigsaw had started to come together. Which, yeah. Once you open up this pact, you start going, that's why it happened. Yeah. That's why. So I, I, it's nice to hear that. I mean, it's it, it's sort of, a, like I say, that early phase of the war, I think in the Western narrative, we just completely don't understand it. I don't think we even misunderstand it. We just don't understand it. Mm. Um, and, that, and Central Europe, we have a we have a sort of traditional myopia about Central Europe anyway. In the West, right? This is this is the attitude that was expressed by Chamberlain in '38 at Munich um, in discussion on the Munich Conference, where he 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 talked about Czechoslovakia, you know, as a faraway country of which we know nothing. Uh, and you could say the same thing, you know, they thought the same thing about Poland in 1939. They thought the same thing about Finland in 1940. It was just somewhere over there between Germany and Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't know much about it. We don't know what its history is. We don't know who lives there. And from a British perspective, most of the time we didn't really care either, um, and that's that's changed. Obviously, you know, there's there's a good number of decades uh, intervening in, in between, mm. but to some extent, I think that attitude still prevails, right? How yeah. many how many ordinary Brits, if you stopped them in the street, could could name the three, you know, the three Baltic states on a map correctly? Not many, not many at all. No, so, but you know. You know I I hope that, you know, what, what's happening in Ukraine and, and people really are beginning to to value the Ukraine yeah. and I understand think, yeah. that actually Europe is Ukraine as well and we are affected by what happens in Ukraine. I and think I think that, that's unique. I don't remember a time where we've had that feeling as strongly. I as absolutely agree. And I think this is part of a much bigger shift that we're seeing with the Ukraine war. Um, there's a shift in terms of the, I, I would argue, the political centre of gravity and, crucially, I would say the moral centre of gravity of Europe, as in the EU, has shifted eastward. Um, you know, Germany is busy sort of hesitating and prevaric prevaricating, um, while Poland is opening its doors to Ukrainian refugees, up to, at last count, five million, was it? Uh, Ukrainian refugees, which is an astonishing performance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Baltic states, if you look at the um, the contributors to Ukraine, Ukraine's defense, um, sort of on a, on a, by a GDP level, they're all the, it's all the East European countries. It's, it's the Baltic states, it's Finland and it's, uh, and it's um, Poland. Um, you know, they understand what's going on in Ukraine better than Western Europe does. I think and, social media has had a really big part because um, I was watching something and oh, this, this, I'm, I'm going to be really honest here. And I, I saw this and it was a video where it was like before the invasion, after the invasion. And I was looking at people in their homes. So there was, you know, the dads playing with the kids in the garden. And then there was a picture of their kitchen and their kitchens looked just like ours, mm -hmm. like modern, beautiful, um, the gardens just look like ours with a little pool and a, and a trampoline and the dad is like on his back and the kids like painting faces. And I think that's the, what's been powerful about social media is just we're able to think, oh, they look just like us. They have family relationships just like we do. And the dads are just like modern dads. 
And I think that's that's been quite a big difference. Um, you know, I, th I think I, I was certainly shocked when <laughs> I was reading. I have to say, by from the microcosm onwards, I began to look at Poland differently. Um, I'd seen it through my parents and my parents' stories about, you know, being in, in a, a farm, a land, you know, people, landowners. And I used to describe it as, well, you know, Poland before the war, it was very medieval. And suddenly I'm I'm hearing about nightclubs and nightclubs tango dancing mm -hmm. and the Berlin cafe culture in Warsaw. I, I just was like, wow. And... That's what I think your writing, Norma Davis' writing, has really done, is to kind of bring, in, bring that kind of um, maybe old perception of what it was like in, into a kind of a mo much more modern and relevant age. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's it's good, very good to hear. Um, you know, I just sort of tell it as I, as I see it. There's no, there's no agenda there beyond, you know, my own fascination with the history. So I just kind of, could try and bring that across and and make it as interesting to to the readers as possible fantastic so, fantastic and you do that you do do that um and you you know you'll have the book talk so anyone who's watching this live um there are still tickets available uh for the book talk not many so get down to the ogniskol.org.uk forward slash events website um but um you know get the book get the book it is fantastic and just one quick question mm. is the impact on 2022 of this i mean we, we've been talking you know so sort of generally yeah. about the war but you know can you sort of in a nutshell why how, how is this impacting us in 2022 um well on a number of levels um the first one being you know you're sitting here in london with your with your cut glass english accents <laughs> um, you're, the, you're the you're the result and you and many other like many others like you are part of this you know this Pol forced polish diaspora which was a result of the nazi soviet pact and the deportations of huge numbers hundreds of thousands if not you know over a million uh poles deported to siberia who then you know the remainder of which get out as we as we well know uh, via persia and, and out into the into the world uh, and most of whom never go home right so in a sense, you know, one of the answers to that question is is you, you sitting there in London with your English accent. There you go. Um, so part of it is that, is that diaspora. Um, of course, Poland's Poland's current frontiers are broadly, I mean, not, not exactly the same before the Green Ink Brigade right in, um, are broadly similar to what was what was decided between the, the um, Moscow and Berlin uh, in 1939, between in those two agreements. There are two agreements that are that are uh, that determine Poland's, or not Poland's frontiers, but the but the division between them, um, and what the Soviets decide to take in 1939 from Poland, they keep and they insist on keeping in 1944-45 when they're then negotiating with the Allies about the future of Poland. So, you know, that's one frontier that is essentially the same as the one drawn up by Hitler and Stalin, and you can you can say the same thing even about Moldova, right? Moldova as a country is essentially the creation of the Nazi Soviet pact, because it's the old Romanian province of Bessarabia, which was taken by the by the Soviets as part of the pact, and then never given back, was reincorporated back into the Soviet Union as an independent Republic of Moldova, minus a couple of bits uh, down to the south, but essentially it's the same as Bessarabia. So you can see that even the modern map of 2022 uh, has scars of the Nazi Soviet pact uh, within it. And I think the last point to make before we go to you know to come right up to date with the Ukraine war, um, this is one of those. I think Russia and the Soviet Union before it, with few exceptions. I think I would hold up, you know, bizarrely someone like Yeltsin. I would hold up actually as a as a relatively positive example of a sort of a, of a sort of Soviet or Russian leader. Um, and he's just dismissed as a drunk in the Western narrative. But I think that I think history will be kinder to him in the long term. Than it will to almost anybody else um, of that uh, of that generation, um, but Russia and the Soviet Union did very well at uh, convincing the outside world that they weren't rogue states, that they were actually, you know, run along rational principles, that they were willing, you know, that the that the rule of law prevailed, and all of this sort of standard stuff that we take for granted in the West. 
and is very good at sort of projecting that image of normality. And there are a couple of times where I think we can see that the mask slipped. And one of them is the Nazi Soviet pact, where Stalin makes a deal with Hitler. Um, he divides up Central Europe between the two of them. He invades Finland. He invades Poland in 1939. He invades and occupies the, the, um, the Baltic states and invades Bessarabia. And so this is a moment when the mask slipped, right? And I think you see another moment that when the mask slipped was in February of, of this year, 2022, when Putin, for a long time, who had been you know, committing these sort of piecemeal aggressions against his neighbors, saber rattling against the outside world, using gas and energy prices and all the rest of it as, as, as a lever to get what he wants. The mask slipped and he, he went for out, like, outright war against Ukraine. Um, and I think these are the moments that sort of betray the grim, dark reality of how the Kremlin works. Um, so we're seeing two of these moments, I think, one playing out at the moment and one in the Nazi Soviet pact. And I think that sort of that parallel is not overstated. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. And you know, it's been a real honour to meet you at last um, on this live stream. Thank you. Um, I just remind everybody again, um, if you're watching this live, um, it's not too late to meet Roger at Ognisko Polskie Book Talk on the 28th of November at 7pm. September. September even. <laughs> September, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm wishing my life away here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and if you're watching this video on YouTube, uh, Roger's book is available in English. Details for the Polish and the US edition are in the comments below. So thank you again, Roger Morehouse. Um, please like, comment and subscribe to hashtag Milondin YouTube. Follow me on Twitter, um, hashtag Milondin. And until next time, do miłego zobaczenia. Bye bye. Bye, Anna. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.